Well, hey everyone, this is Chris DeFurio with Keys to the Shop. Welcome to another edition of Shift Break. Today's episode is brought to you by La Marzocco, who's been making espresso machines by hand in Florence since 1927. La Marzocco is at the heart of some of the world's best coffee bars, and over these nearly 100 years, they have built their reputation by serving their customers, by creating some of the world's most innovative, beautiful, and dependable espresso machines. And this is all to help you be successful as a coffee retailer. Uh, Machines like the KB90 espresso machine with its straight in locking portafilters for ergonomics, the scales in the drip tray for accurate espresso extraction, as well as the auto flush in the group head to keep things clean and moving so it improves your workflow. It's just one example of the kind of innovation that has been developed to serve your needs. There's lots of different kinds of espresso machines that La Marzocco makes that fits your need perfectly. Email them at info at LaMarzocoUSA.com and one of their salespeople will be happy to assist you. If you're looking to upgrade your coffee equipment, then I highly recommend that you consider a La Marzocco for your shop. Go check them out over at LaMarzocoUSA.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Espressly, who creates custom branded mobile apps for your coffee shop. So you're not just a dot on a map with Espressly. Your customers have in the palm of their hands a customized to your brand experience. So it feels like your coffee bar. It's wonderful and it's also very convenient. So it's a no risk model. When you use Espressly for your mobile app, there's no setup or development fees. You get a drive through payment scanner, receipt and label printing capabilities. All of the data is stored in the app and it integrates with some of the world's best payment processing systems, including Square. So if you've been thinking about getting an app for your coffee bar and you want to stand out from the crowd, then I definitely recommend going with Espressly. Check them out over at Espressly.co. That's Espressly.co. Okay, everybody. Well, today I wanted to talk to you about toxic loyalty. Now, there's a kind of loyalty that people feel toward uh, another person or a brand that is built on a relationship of trust where they know then because they've had experience with this company or with this person that they can trust that anything that they produce or that their encounters with them are going to, you know, align with their values in a certain way. They are trustworthy, they are dependable, and therefore that trustworthiness and consistency, uh, the the lining up of values and all that stuff produces loyalty. It produces customer loyalty, it produces staff loyalty. The question that we should be asking ourselves is, what do we consider disloyalty? Do we consider it disloyal for a customer to get coffee from another coffee bar? I think in some ways the answer might be yes. It is disloyal, but it really comes with a lot of baggage when you say loyalty and disloyalty. It sounds very moral. You know, it sounds like in, it, disloyalty is an immoral act and loyalty is is almost assumed. Like if you go to my coffee bar, you're loyal to my coffee bar. So from a customer perspective, it's easy to see how you could consider somebody maybe more loyal than somebody else. And the way that we uh, try to get people to be loyal to us is we reward them with um, little tricks and you know cards and points and things like that. But that really doesn't touch on why people love to go to a particular place. In fact, if people are going to your establishment solely because you reward them with points and cards and you know bonuses and stuff like that, it's really not a sustainable model for doing business at all. And the value proposition of your business is probably pretty weak in that you kind of have to buy people's loyalty with these points by giving away product and and things like that. But the idea of loyalty from a transactional point of view is easily seen. This is not so easily seen with your staff, but it's still something that owners think about when it comes time to judge whether or not a barista is loyal to the company. Here's how I would define loyalty to a company. Loyalty is advocacy in my opinion, when I of my free will advocate for a person or advocate for a company, I am engaging in something that a loyal customer or a loyal friend or partner would do. That's what I do. I'm loyal to this person. Now, when I am not loyal, I withhold my advocacy. I withhold my enthusiasm. 
I don't look for opportunities to uh, do those things either. And owners really want people to do this. Owners really want baristas to advocate, to be enthused, to do all of these things. And certainly there is a reasonable amount of enthusiasm and buy-in that every professional who seeks to apply for a job should bring to the table. However, this is a two-way street. There has to be trust built up through proven actions over time that starts with the leadership showing that they indeed are worthy of the staff's advocacy. When it comes time for hiring, the staff are telling their friends, you should work here. You know, they're not uh, just staying quiet or worse off, they're saying, don't work here. <laughs> when you show yourself trustworthy through uh, you know, having reliable schedules and operations that are people first operations and systems, when you are, uh, when you have a culture of feedback and a culture of care for the staff and are fixing things and are communicative, I mean, just go through the library of keys to the shop on leadership and management, then you'll see the themes. They'll, they'll jump out at you. If you're doing all that, you're way more likely than not to find your staff reciprocating with advocacy and loyalty. But when we start seeing people not be loyal in that way, we, we, and, and let's stop using the word loyal and we'll just use the word advocates, uh, we call that disloyalty. We call that, oh, they're not down for the business. And often we end up making this way more personal and it crosses kind of a boundary where we start saying, you know, you're not a true believer really. Uh, of the business. You're not down for the brand. You're not repping the brand, you know, and we expect people to go the extra mile, but we're not really giving people any kind of um, reason to do so. And even by the way, if we do give people a reason to do so, we do not deserve people's advocacy. All you deserve as an employer is that the person that has agreed in this mutual contract uh, to work for you comes to you and works for you. That is it. In their free time, that's not your jurisdiction. But we want to make it our jurisdiction. We want to, you know, really amp people up and we set this kind of bar for who we're going to uh, pour into based on how far beyond the scope of their job they go. You know, think about our shift break episode when we talk about um, when going above and beyond goes too far, or the one talking about reasonable expectations. When we get into that realm, now we're trying to win toxic loyalty. It's not a relationship of mutuality that respects the free will of the individual. It's basically trying to shape people with a social hammer and make them conform against their will, or else they'll be ostracized for the community. You know, they'll be um, thought of as less. It's basically like, why can't you be like your brother? Why can't you be like this person over here who tells their friends about the business and wears our t-shirts to public events and, you know, that kind of stuff. And the answer is maybe they have a good reason why not. Also, maybe you're not uh, the kind of company that they're really enthusiastic about, which you need to take a look at why not, you know, not in a defensive way, because we often get defensive when people are not as enthusiastic about what we do as we are, or that one person is. And we, we take it personally instead of taking it as a professional bit of feedback that we can use to innovate ways to create a better environment where we are more likely to get that kind of advocacy that is, again, a decision that your staff make through their own free will. You don't deserve that particular part of their mental real estate or their social real estate. We think we do. And because we think we do, often what you see is managers or owners will take it out on that barista by withholding feedback, reward, coaching, attention, manage them out, so to speak, because they resonate more with the exuberance of this group of people versus the neutrality of that group of people. So in order to not dip into toxic loyalty, we need to own the cultivation of the environment in order to produce the kind of results that we think are good indicators that people are excited about the brand, but hold it with an open hand because not every amazing and great employee 
is going to be an advocate for the company the way that you think advocacy should work. And that's okay. Don't demonize them by omitting them from attention and coaching and opportunities and things like that. Anything beyond the work that is required of the job is extra and is awesome. It's awesome when you get that. It is a good sign. It's a great sign. But you can't force that. The absence of it can be an indicator of a problem. Not always, but it can be. And our job as operators is to go in and say, we're continually cultivating. We're continually making the ground more fertile to make sure that people feel cared for, to make sure that customers feel cared for. And this group of people, these two groups of people, the, the, the baristas and the customers, this is what we're all about, their world. And when they do take it upon themselves to advocate freely for your business, that's awesome. And that's a great indicator. But we can't force these things to happen. We can only be stewards of the environment and as well as we can take care of the people that have been entrusted to us as leaders. And then what we'll get back is that advocacy, that loyalty that takes patience. It takes humility. It takes work, but it's worth it in the end. So I hope that this was a helpful episode for you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Don't forget to follow Keys to the Shop on Instagram at Keys to the Shop. Reach out to me if you have any questions, comments, or feedback. Chris at Keys to the Shop.com. Be sure to share these episodes and subscribe to the show. And I will see you here next week on another edition of Shift Break from Keys to the Shop.